G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that fantastic podcast that focuses on sci-fi movies, TV shows and a bit of the old Australian sci-fi fandom. I'm your host Dags and with me is a dude who is that cool. Did you know he once tried to colour his hair with a nice red tinge, yet after discovering he had some colour left, he decided to colour his eyebrows too. Yes, it's welcome to Jeffro. Hello there, everybody. I could say that might have been a uh, aborted attempt to sort of do uh, Sting from uh, June, but uh, no, it wasn't. Just my uh, not knowing what I'm doing, which is probably 80% of the time sort of uh, an example of what I'm uh, all about. Well, it was actually kind of funny because you did walk out of the bathroom at the time and I was like, what's wrong with your head, dude? It's like, oh, I had some colour left over, decided to colour my eyebrows, <laughs> no, red eyebrows. Kind of wasn't working, man, but it was a funny time. We were all a bit young and a bit silly and a bit innocent, so uh, absolutely loved it. And, and damn your long-term memory retention because I was kind of hoping that one that would have been forgotten by now, but no, you remember it. Never going to be forgotten. Once again, if, as we mentioned last week, if you need to find out more of these wonderful stories, just go uh, Google the Jeff Rowe page. It should be the very first thing that pops up, and there's going to be all these awesome stories that we'll continue to share as a uh, we count down our episodes to the number 10, potentially Spinal Tap 11. You never, never know. Anyway, Jeff Rowe, quickly, how are you going on, son? I'm doing very well. So um, I have uh, been doing a, a little bit of collecting uh, lately, so I have scored my... Uh, self a whole bunch of uh, Doki Who DVDs. So um, I'm very excited about that. Well, who the hell would need that many coffee coasters? That's the question I've got to ask. But there you go. With that in <laughs> mind, speaking of the collecting, um, I understand we actually received a letter this week. Remember, fans, you can write into us and send us letters and comments that we will uh, address on this particular show. And you've got one right here, Mr. Jeffro. So tell us what it says. We do indeed. And this is a letter from Mickey J who uh, is basically saying, Dear Dags and Jeff, I really think Jeff's awesome, but can we get rid of Dags? Oh, no, sorry, that's I shouldn't have mentioned that. That's, that was not meant to be discussed. <laughs> so uh, it says, Dear nerds, my husband wants to rip his action figures off their cards. Is this crazy? Well, this is what we're going to discuss. Well, it's a very, very good point, and it's one of those alter. It's like the uh, question of the universe, isn't it? It's like, what do you do to leave on on packet or off packet? And it's kind of funny because one of the things that uh, I've been doing uh, in the past couple of years was actually uh, hosting a live uh, video show, which you can find on YouTube on the Sci Fi Channel, called "Rip It Off the Card," all about dealing with uh, collectibles and whether to leave them in the packets or take them off the packets. Now, as you and I have got a bit of a collecting history. So uh, you, you, I think you're still, as you mentioned about your Doctor Who DVDs, you're still buying uh, bits and pieces, aren't you? Oh, absolutely. And I find the older I get, the less uh, protective I am about keeping things sort of uh, mint in, in box and such. So uh, I do shock myself sometimes thinking, well, this mass-produced toy is never going to go up, so I'm actually going to uh, take it out of the box slash card. So uh, I do tend to sort of find myself leaning in that direction. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because uh, so I stopped collecting myself personally way back in 1997. I was actually into Batman collecting, and I sort of got a bit sick of it, and uh, and I sort of stopped after that. But it's interesting to, from my perspective, watching people still buy items, uh, various age groups, uh, to seeing what they do with them. Uh, I get to spend uh, a weekend every couple of weeks uh, working out at a store called Aaron's Collectibles, which is in Blackburn, uh, Victoria. And Aaron was the guy that I was uh, doing the Rip It Off The Card series with. And it's an interesting sort of point of view that he brings up, which I tend to agree with, even though I'm a leave it in packet person. He acknowledges and says that uh, sometimes taking things out of the packets, which is what we do in the store for display purposes, actually helps the buyer because then they don't get into that psychological uh, rut as to wondering whether they should think take things out of packets or not. The job's been done for them. Therefore, they're more willing to buy loose products. And I find that to be really interesting, and I have actually seen it occur in the store personally. So um, what do you think about that? Do you reckon that actually makes a lot of sense? I, I think that's actually a, a very good thing that does make a lot of sense because I was doing a bit of research on this uh, topic online, and it seems that the general consensus is that people love to be able to feel a, an actual uh, action figure and, you know, sort of touch it and, um, and move it and, and such and, and work on the different uh, points of articulation. So 
uh, the fact that if it's in a box just means that they don't sort of get that kind of pleasure. It's sort of caged behind a, a cardboard and um, plastic wall, essentially. Yeah, and another aspect of this too, this is something that I'm consciously aware of, uh, is, and I actually had this occur to me in the store a couple of weeks ago where somebody was asking me about uh, what's a good item to purchase for an investment. And I thought, well, if you're buying something as an investment, which means you're planning to resell it in a later date for a profit, everything has to stay in its packet, you know, the way mint in box, that old uh, catchphrase. But by the same token, there are some items that are simply not worth investing in. I mean, I've seen it myself personally, where you can have items after 30, 40 years have not appreciated in value at all. So just because something is still mint in a box doesn't mean that decades from now, you're going to be like um, cashing it in and making a fortune out of it. So for that reason, if you're consciously aware that what you're getting doesn't hold any intrinsic value except for yourself and your enjoyment of it, then I would say, yeah, take it out of its packaging. But uh, these days, it would be very unlikely to buy anything that's manufactured yesterday and expect that 30, say 2040, uh, it'll be worth a million bucks because that's simply not going to be the case. I had a uh, very good example of that because back in the, uh, the 90s, I invested in a Robin Hood Prince of Thieves battle wagon because I thought, this is awesome. It's big. It's it's not going to be something that uh, you're going to see too many of in, you know, like 30 or 40 years' time. So I held on to it, never touched it, just kept it all mint as best as I could. And then I put it on eBay and no bites. Dropped the price down. Lou listed it. No bites put it for a rock bottom price thinking come on this is mint in box it hasn't been touched you've got to you got to want this and um, guess what I did I opened it up had a bit of a play around with it and then donated it to the, the uh, op shop so uh, yeah it uh, doesn't always uh, work as you hope yeah, well, that's funny because uh, I mean I think and it's been proven that items from the 60s and the 70s, maybe a little bit of the 80s still in packets have a value to them. But once you start getting into the late 80s and 90s and the 2000s, it doesn't work at all. And yet um, a lot of people sort of felt that anything produced for a franchise is going to be worth a fortune in the future. It just hasn't panned out that way at all. And the other thing too, and this, you made up a very interesting point there. Um, I once said to someone when they asked me about collecting, first the advice about collecting, I say is don't. But if you're going to do it, um, be aware that, you know, I mean, this is a slightly out-of-date topic now, but a, a $30,000 stamp collection would sit on in, in folders in one bookshelf, but a $30,000 toy collection, especially if they're large ones like your Battle Wagon and some other big play sets, they could take three bedrooms to store. And it's the storage is the hardest part. And I, I said to people that, you know, it's all well and good to have all these items in their boxes, but you have to lug these things around for decades. And in some cases, you have to have them longer than you own a car, a house, some relationships, uh, furniture. That's a big thing to just uh, like to lug around through your entire life, hoping that one day you'll be able to sell them for a massive profit. And uh, that's why I think, and I tend to agree with you, that uh, some items, um, even though I believe that the moment you take them out of their packet, they just lose their value immediately, uh, just for the sheer enjoyment of it. You know, sometimes, yeah. And it's kind of funny I'm saying this, but I, I tend to agree sometimes, yeah, just rip it out and be done with it. Well, I, I know for a fact uh, when I moved, I had a good number of different uh, uh, corgi and dinky um, toys that were in like a what they call a blister box. So it's not actually a box. It's, it's got like a, um, a cardboard base and then a plastic top. And I was forever fretting that it was going to be damaged in transit because um, those things are very fragile. So uh, uh, if I'd just taken them out of the... Um, uh, the box it probably would have been easier to, to carry so uh, yeah i definitely relate to that so you now say that you you take things out of your packets is that right is that how you've sort of like come around full circle yeah i i resigned to the fact that um these things aren't really going to appreciate much if they're in the uh, packaging and certainly displayability wise uh they they look better out of the packet because you you do get to actually sort of uh, pose them you get the colors are a bit more vibrant behind the uh, uh the plastic and there's some that are actually in boxes so all you get to see is the uh the the image you don't even get to see it uh when it's actually in a, a complete cardboard box 
Yeah, actually, that's a very good point. I mean, I come from, an, as I said earlier, an, a, a box-only sort of dude. I never took anything out of packets, even rubbish that I got, uh, say, from Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, or even like McDonald's where they were in the cheapest plastic bags you can imagine. There was no labelling on them or anything, and I've still kept items like that. It was just part of my, my programming to never take anything out of its packet. But I agree with you. There are things that when they're loose, they do display well, and they do look good, and they're much better that way. And it's kind of funny because statues... Now, even though they're not really like action figures or anything, but statues that are being produced for the adult collector market are so large and so impressive, they actually by default need to come out of their packets and their boxes to be put on display because sometimes the boxes, as you said, they, the artwork is great, but to see the physical item itself uh, loose, uh, you know, it just looks grouse. And you can, in most cases, put them back in the boxes when necessary and reseal them back up. But uh, that's another facet to um, unboxing that is a, a bit of a big deal at the moment, which is uh, very groovy. Yeah, and I mean, you know what they say about uh, collectors that keep things in, in boxes? Whoa. It might as well look like a warehouse because, you know, it's not really displaying anything. It just uh, is a series of boxes lined up in a row. So uh, uh, it's not as appealing as when you can actually uh, see the things out large in charge. True. But the other side of the coin is that if somebody was uh, thinking, well, I'll just I'll take everything out of their packets, and before you know it, they've just gone back right through to products of the of the 70s and the 60s, and they're just ripping packets open left, right, and center. Yeah, there are some things that have just got to stay sealed, and the reason for that is because they're just so rare. They're just You can't find them anywhere anymore, and it's that hit-and-miss scenario of saying, well, what should be kept and what doesn't need to be kept. And that was the reason that I um, kept all my stuff mint because I remember vividly the day when I was um, probably about 11 or 12 when um, the second or third series of Star Wars action figures came out and I had the Snaggletooth figure. And I, just for that one brief millisecond, I thought, what if I leave it in the packet and don't open it? What, if, what happens if I just do that? And, of course, I ripped it open and that was into that. Now, by today's standards, that figure may be worth a couple of hundred dollars now, you know, the original first edition Snaggletooth. So even though it's easy to say, yes, take things out of their packets because there's a lot of um, joy you can get from them, there are some items that need to stay packaged because the, the less items there are in that condition, the more value you have. The problem is there aren't that many items that where that occurs. So it's a real sort of like um, toss-up between what do you do, when do you take things out of packets, when do you not. So there is that too. Don't, don't just go unboxing everything for the sake of it, kids. Well, there is a, uh, a growing industry that's called resealing. So what they do is they get the card, they get the bubble and the figure, and they actually glue the whole thing back together again. And this is apparently an acceptable practice. As long as you advertise that you have uh, uh, done that, then uh, those figures, whilst not quite as available as a, um, uh, a mint unopened one, they come pretty darn close. I'm glad you pointed that out because, yes, you would have to advertise the fact that it's been resealed. And it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, resealing and reattaching and all these sort of terms are uh, pretty important to collectors out there who are very pedantic, as, as they well they should be when they're spending so much money on these things, uh, are expecting stuff to be as if it came off the production line yesterday, despite being 30, uh, 40 years ago. Um, however, having said all that, there is one thing I definitely think that will never appreciate in value, and I'd just say rip these out of boxes left, right and centre, a Funko Pops. I don't think any of them will be worth anything 30, 40 years from now. As far as I'm concerned, they're not worth putting my jacket up my car tyres with <laughs> at the moment. I can't stand them. <laughs> Well, as, as you know, I collect Funko Pops, and the advantage of the packaging is at least it's in a, a box that allows you to uh, stack them on each other. So if you've ever seen some uh, Funko mm. collections, basically it's, it's needed because uh, we collect hundreds of them, so we've got to actually be able to stack them. And there was uh, one disadvantage I had one time where I stacked it about seven foot high, and then suddenly yeah, they toppled. Boy, was that a mess. It's funny, interesting, because like I remember a time when they didn't exist and now the damn things are absolutely everywhere. And uh, who knows, I might be proven wrong in the years to come, but uh, if anything, it might be the odd one or two that might have some value, but for the, the most part, they just uh, take up a lot of space. But anyway, each their own. I mean, it's all sort of worth it and good fun for everyone. And I guess in the end, um, if you are spending money on all these products, you would want to at least enjoy them for whatever reason. 
And uh, But if you're a person who's a mint in box dude and just chooses not to take stuff out of their packets, I fully respect that uh, and I totally get it. And because one day what you want is for someone to look at your collection and say, oh, I used to have one of those, but I took it out of the packet. And you can look at them straight in the eye and say, well, mine's still in the box. So back mm, at you, son. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it also means that sometimes if you've got accessories, uh, you know, all it takes is sort of like one of those guns or something like that that comes with your figure to get lost and suddenly uh, you feel really bad that, uh, you know, it's not worth as much uh, without the uh, extra bits. Actually, you bring up a very good point. If you are going to take something out of its packet, you've got to keep it complete. Don't lose the bits, especially up the vacuum cleaner. Um, and sometimes mm. some of those accessories, whether they be weapons or, you know, handheld items or whatever for the, so let's say, action figures in this case, um, they can be worth almost more than the actual product itself. So we see it in the, um, the store all the time in Aaron's Collectibles, as I said. People bring in loose figures. Where's the attachments? Where's the weapons? Where's the bits? Nah, lost them years ago. So it's a shame because that's where the value is. So there's a bit of advice out there for people. If you are going to unbox something, uh, make sure you keep all the bits. There are some action figures that got produced, say, for Star Wars. And I think from a point of view of just making sure they got a lot of sales, they'd have one figure, but it's five or six different accessories. And you go, mate, it'd be easy to lose any of these. So keeping those all together is uh, it's actually quite important from a resale perspective. Plus, the thing looks good too. So um, there's a bit of advice for you. And the other thing too is if you're going to take something out of a box, film it and put it on YouTube because people love unboxing videos all over the place. So uh, you could actually uh, make yourself a few cents by uh, filming the uh, the product coming off the card or, or coming out of the box. And it's very funny. When we did the introduction for Rip It Off The Card, we actually had a guy in the store. He bought a Doctor Who figure. And we actually filmed him go <laughs> ripping it open. And I thought, oh, just a part of me just died inside. <laughs> Not good at all. But I'm going to say one last bit before we move on. If you do buy an item, you take it out of the packet and then you find 20 years later that you've lost all your value on it. Don't come crying to me because I'll say to you, should have left it mint on the card, son. Mint in box all the way. What do you reckon? Enjoy it while you can. That's all I can say. Very, very cool. And who sent in that particular letter there, uh, Mr. Jeffro? That was uh, Mr. Mickey J. <laughs> Good old Mickey J. Absolutely fantastic. All right, so it's time for us to move on to our main topic of conversation. And this is something that Jeffro has brought up, which is a bit of a controversial one, especially these days. So, uh, Jeffro, what exactly are we chatting about uh, this evening? So this is something that's really spawned uh, because of COVID. We are now finding that uh, people are now debating whether to see something in the cinema or just simply wait to see it on um, streaming. So we have what we call the uh, Cineplex versus the Sofaplex situation. So we're going to debate the pros and cons of each side. Off the top of my head, I'm going to ask you what you think. I'm going to assume that you're going to say both. Well, I am going to say yes, both, but if anything, I prefer the cinema. And I think the reason is that um, you've got cinephiles that truly appreciate film, and then you've got the casual viewer. So for me, being able to see something in a level of detail with a level of sound, and also, more importantly, with an audience and getting that, uh, that feedback from the audience and the good scenes uh, is something that I really enjoy. But there are times where I'll say, well, is this movie worth paying uh, X amount of dollars? And I know that tickets cost anywhere from about $10 upwards, depending on where you go. $20 is not uh, unheard of to, to spend um, at, a, um, at a cinema. Yeah, it's a good point. There are definitely some movies you wouldn't necessarily go to the cinema for. And I always used to use this example, like, you know, this is just putting it out there, like a Driving Miss Daisy kind of movie. You don't need to see that on a big screen, whereas clearly a lot of the MCU movies and the DC movies and the big sci-fi movies uh, would naturally uh, be beneficial on a large cinema screen. And you are right. So the ticket price is an issue because, you know, if you have a family of four, you know, the two adults and the two kids and whatever else, and once you get your popcorn and drink and whatever else, you could end up being a bit of an expensive outing. But that may be a positive thing because one of the things that I find with cinemas that works in their favour is that unlike if you're sitting at home watching something on a, a streaming service or on DVD or Blu-ray, when you're in the cinema, you just sit and watch the show and you're fully focused on what's going on. 
Whereas at home, it's so easy to be distracted, whether by choice or by someone's ringing up or you think just, oh, there's a boring bit in the movie, I'll just check now Facebook and whatever else. And you may actually miss aspects of the show. And at the end, you may say, well, that movie wasn't as good as I thought it was. And that was because you weren't paying attention the whole way. So uh, at least at a cinema, you are focused on why you're there because you've made the effort to go there, park the car, go inside, buy the ticket. And for that reason, I think that actually has a massive benefit to it. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's how I sort of look at it. I was listening to that and it suddenly made me uh, remember there was a time where we saw a movie and there was just a family of six and the kids were maybe hopped up on uh, Orange Cordial. I don't know. But it was so distracting to try and watch the um, uh, the movie because these kids were just playing around and just not paying attention to the movie. So, uh, And you can't really escape it. You, you're in your seat. You're there. They're there, and um, and you just have to sort of uh, get yourself through the uh, the moment. But uh, it doesn't always uh, work. There are distractions from uh, other audience uh, members. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. It can be a hit and miss experience. You can have one where the entire audience is invested in the program and they're all sort of sharing the ride together, or you can have a scenario where someone's just you know, giving you the shits. These days, the common issue is someone's on their phone, three or four aisles down, and you've seen this bright light coming out of the seats. Uh, yeah, that is... A downside to it a cheaper cinema like with really cheap tickets you're more likely as a guest to have uh unexpected interruptions from other audience members as opposed to say your gold classes or um, places like that but either way uh that is one thing that i do find works from a cinema perspective and there are so i don't go to the cinema at all it's just not something I'm, I'm, I, I enjoy doing but on exceptions i will because i would say yes i do actually want to see this on the big screen and the mindset of saying, well, I'll just wait for something to come out on streaming, that's providing that happens and when it happens. So as an example, as of right now, I don't think John Wick 4 has come out anywhere yet and I'm sort of waiting for that. And uh, so there could be scenarios where people are saying, well, that's okay, I'll just wait three or four weeks and it'll be out on a streaming service and it may not actually appear for any length of time. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, a tricky one. It is a uh, hot topic in terms of uh, at the moment movies are coming out fairly quickly onto the streaming platforms and there's a big argument to say well let's see if we can expand the amount of time so people might be interested in going to see a movie if they have to wait four or six months rather than sort of four to six weeks so um, there are some movies that I really felt should have been shown on the, uh, the cinema screen but they went straight to um, streaming and there was an arrangement uh, with uh, home box office. So uh, particularly in America, we uh, they didn't see June go uh, to the cinemas that went to um, the uh, streaming platform. And we were lucky here in Australia. We did get a release. But um, there were other movies like uh, the second Knives Out movie where that was uh, commissioned by Netflix. And everyone was saying they should have released that in the cinemas. But, and they would have made a whole ton of money, but they uh, elected not to. So it went straight to um, the streaming platform. And I really think they should do a little bit more of what they've done in the past and have limited releases, show a movie in the cinema for two to three weeks, and then chuck it onto the, uh, the streaming platform. So you get to choose what you want to do. So if you want to wait, you can wait. But those people want to see uh, a, a movie in the cinema, whether it be June, uh, Pixar Soul, another example, uh, the um, the movie The Irishman, which was uh, uh, highly acclaimed, um, and um, and little things like uh, the Weird Al Yankovic uh, story that would have been nice to have seen in the uh, the cinema with a an audience where we could all laugh together, but they went straight to uh, to video. That's an interesting point, though, and Netflix movies that Netflix have created and they don't get cinematic release, and you're thinking, well, that'd be awesome to see on the big screen. It's kind of funny how that uh, works. It never really sort of crossed my mind before. There is an advantage these days where people have now got larger televisions and home theatres are a bit more common. I think at, uh, like back in our old days, um, you know, if streaming existed back in the 1990s and you're watching something on a CRT TV, even the bigger CRT TVs there would not have been enough to sort of compete against what cinemas can offer 
uh, well, home cinemas can offer these days. So it's definitely not an apples for apples comparison. It's uh, definitely a bit of an uphill struggle for the old cinematic uh, side of things. But there are still plenty of people out there who say, you know what, I want to see something on the big screen, as you see, with really good sound and uh, make a bit of a night of it, which is absolutely fantastic. And I do wonder, here's a question for you, about independent cinemas. Okay, so I think everything we've been discussing is about the big chains, but independent ones, which only show one-off movies, so uh, like one a particular movie on one night only, which most people probably would have seen before. Um, hey, what are your thoughts on those? Do you reckon they still have a place in the in, in the world and whether they would still be successful? If anything, I think they've got a, a growing place uh, in so much as that if you look at uh, America, they're really leading the way with this kind of thing. So you've got uh, a chain of cinemas called the uh, Alamo Draft House. And they will do special screenings of of movies, and they'll accompany it by uh, putting something extra on, whether it be sort of uh, uh, an interview with the director or, or something like that. So they do these specialty ones, and they've been extremely uh, popular. So uh, I think there's going to be a place for uh, being able to show classic movies or show indie movies that uh, that uh, need an audience. So we're kind of lucky because in Melbourne we still have a number of independent cinemas and uh, one of them in particular, the Asta, actually produces a calendar that shows all their films that they're showing for the next six months. Typically they'll do it A and a B screening. So you'll have, for example, uh, Alien and Aliens on the same night and Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2 on the same night. And for that reason, a lot of people really dial into going to these cinema to see these movies, even though they've seen them umpteen times. But to see them in the cinema together as a pairing Uh, and the ticket prices if I recall are relatively cheap too and I'm curious to see after all these years whether that still gets uh, a good turnout and sometimes I don't know if this happens to you in your part of the world but friends will put the word out saying oh blah 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 is on at the Asta who wants to come along and it's just a one night only thing and uh, I think that's fantastic and if those chains can continue to operate into the future then that at least is one good thing I'd like to think that the independence is still going strong. Well, I've seen this also happen with the majors. For example, um, they had the anniversary of uh, Terminator 2 and they released it in the 3D version and it and it was excellent. And before we saw Avatar 2, they released the original Avatar into the cinemas and, and it was brilliant to go see that and it got a good audience. And I remember back in the day, uh, I think they released Titanic about twice uh, mm. because uh, it was just something that people would go see time and time again. It's just such a, uh, a well-loved movie. And uh, even things like recently with um, Return of the Jedi, we saw uh, a limited uh, run of a movie that came out in the 80s and, um, and people wanted to see it on the big screen and uh, came out for that. Yeah, it's a good example here because Jedi turned 40 years old this year. And uh, you are right. Yeah, word got out. Oh, it's back on the big screen and all that. So there's still an attraction for it. So here's a question for you. So clearly older people uh, would still like going to the cinema because of nostalgic reasons because, hey, we used to do it all when we were much younger. But what about young people to the Gen Zs and the millennials and all those sort of people? What about them? Do you think they get attracted to the cinema by themselves as opposed to going with family members? Do you, any Any thoughts on that? I think you've made a very valid comment because I'm trying to cast my mind back to when I've gone to see a movie. You know, what is the typical age of the uh, the audience? And uh, I don't see too many teenagers when I go in to see these movies. So I think you've hit upon a point in so much as that they're used to the online uh, lifestyle, whether it be sort of watching YouTube videos or, or anything else. Uh, they are more likely to want to stream things. And I know with my own son, you know, that's exactly what uh, he likes to do. And getting him to the cinema is like sort of uh, trying to pull teeth out. It's just something that um, he only goes just to be nice to his parents. Yeah, it probably could come under the heading of it's a pain in the ass to just have to do it. Oh, my God, I've got to go somewhere to go and see a movie when I can just do it right here and now. That's probably not boding well for the future. Um, having said that, there's probably a complete role reversal for the Barbie movie that came out recently where every man and his dog couldn't get enough of that. And I think that was an example, probably an unusual example, where it was, okay, we're off to the movies, even if they haven't been in the movies for 100 years, because this is the biggest, hottest ticket in town. Mm. And it does go to show that it might not happen very often, but it can still happen. 
and uh, that's a good thing. And one of the things you may uh, notice in a lot of the trailers is they the good ones will say only in the cinemas. So they really stress that point to say, well, okay, if you want to see it, you're not going to see it uh, streaming anytime soon. It's only in the cinemas and we'll release it uh, online sort of when we feel like it. So when you see that, it really encourages you to want to, uh, to see it in the cinema because uh, by the time it comes out on streaming, you know, everybody's talking about it. You may get spoilers and you don't really want to ruin the experience. Another factor that's coming up now, which is a bit of an issue, is the recent announcement from uh, Disney Plus, or Disney, sorry, saying that they're going to stop production of physical media, which in this case, in this country, which is DVDs and uh, Blu-rays. Uh, and of course, that's clearly a test case for the rest of the world. So at some point, you probably think that physical media is going to stop production. So typically what happens is someone sees a movie at the cinema, they wait for the DVD and or Blu-ray release to come out, they purchase it. I know you're like this because you're a bit of a collector of uh, this sort of media and they can watch it whenever they want, which is which is great. So they've sort of effectively paid money to see it in the cinema once and then paid money to buy the physical media afterwards. But if that production stops, Will that then encourage people to go to the cinema more often to say, well, I've got to see it here because, as we discussed, it may not come out on streaming for a period of time or it may be released on a service that I don't have a subscription to and allowing for the fact that it would probably encourage uh, online downloading piracy, putting that aside, do you think that the um, if the physical media thing becomes uh, an issue where they stop producing DVDs and Blu-rays for just about everything, that more people will go to the cinema to see something because they know that'll be the best time that they can actually catch up with a product that they won't normally get to see. It is a potential situation because I know that uh, there's been times where I've said, well, okay, I won't go see it in the cinema, but it's cheaper for me to actually buy it on um, uh, DVD or Blu-ray or what have you because if I don't like the movie, then it's less of an investment. So... Uh, if you do love the movie, then you've got your physical copy and you've seen it. So whereas if you go to the movie and you don't like it, you go, well, that was a waste of $20. So, um, But I see media uh, hanging in there. It's a bit like uh, vinyl records. Uh, I, I see that the, the base uh, fan um, demand for uh, physical media will, will keep it afloat. So I don't think as much as people are saying, well, Disney were drawing and everything like that. I don't see it being a long term uh, thing where it'll it'll just die off. Yeah, it's a good point, and uh, I mean there are examples of DVD and or Blu Ray releases that you think and thank God that they did that because you just cannot get those versions anywhere. The first thing that's my sprung to mind was the extended version of Lord of the Rings and that fantastic mega. Um, DVD case set that they produced all those years ago. If you wanted the extended version, that was the only way to see it. Even now, I mean, you've got uh, Lord of the Rings on Netflix, but it's the theatrical release. So uh, there is definitely examples where physical media and having it in your collection is definitely the way to go. Um, there's another thing to bring up too about uh, the people who work on these productions. Uh, and this is something I know that you were sort of keen to sort of have a bit of a quick chat about is um, the cast and crew uh, who work on these productions. Um, they work on a big massive film and it goes primarily to the streaming services and of course the downside to the streaming services which most people don't even realize is that depending on which one it goes to it may um, eliminate half their audience who are not subscribed to that service because these days whenever you say to someone have you seen this movie the first response is what's it on and if you say it's on amazon and the response is well i'm not subscribed to amazon but i'd love to see the film they just won't see it so a large portion of your target audience is going to be missing out on your products. And the people who work on these things, um, I reckon, and I think you think uh, about the same way, that uh, it's a bit of a concern for them. What are your thoughts on that? You're absolutely right in so much as that you do have to be on the right uh, platform. And one of the advantages of physical media is that you could just order the, uh, the DVD or Blu-ray and you'd be able to see it. So um, the fact that uh, if the media is slowly dropping off, then, yeah, you, you're losing a potential audience. I remember there was a, um, a, a TV series that uh, our friend Aaron recommended, brilliant show and all that, 
And I thought, this is great. I've got Netflix, I've got uh, Amazon, and I went to look as to who had it, and it was Binge. And I thought, oh, well, I'm never going to see that. And uh, I just really want to see it, but uh, I don't want to subscribe to uh, another streaming platform. And I think that's a big issue at the moment. And so if it's something that's right up your alley and you go, you know what, I am the target audience for this product, um, I just can't see because I'm not subscri subscribed to it. Whereas if it's in the cinema, everyone can go. Uh, and I think that's the one thing that cinema has in its favour. It's the great equaliser. Everyone can attend to go and see it. Sure, they're going to pay money to go and see it, but at least everyone is able to do that. And I think if cinema was to use a promotional tool to say why they have a place in the world, that could probably be it to say, well, if you can't see it on streaming because you're not subscribed to whatever, and there are plenty of people out there who aren't subscribed to anything purely from a financial reason, you could say, well, look, for you, there's a $10 cinema down the road. You can see the movie there. We're all good, right? And, uh, and I think there's a fair bit in that. So for that reason alone, I would argue that cinema has its place in the world and that uh, people will still be attracted to it for the foreseeable future. And a lot of those cinemas are run by, you know, regular people. So, you know, they've got to make an income and they need something that's going to generate that income for them. So uh, if they get a chance to get some decent movies, then obviously they'll get an audience in and, um, as I said, start to uh, uh, fully recover. But uh, after COVID, it seems like they're getting sort of the... Uh, uh, the, the dregs and only occasionally getting a, a big budget movie that uh, allows them to uh, profit from uh, uh, the, the, the desire to see a, a movie on the big screen. Mm, yeah, interesting point. So I think in the end, there's room for both the Cinemaplex and the Sofaplex. Usually one follows on from the other. And I think that uh, providing that uh, the two of them can live harmoniously together and it should be good for everybody who wants to go and check out whatever it is they want to see, whether it be a big screen or a small screen. Um, yeah, there's room for both to coexist. And, uh, I mean, there's just some movies that you wouldn't want to see on the uh, big screen anyway, like anything that Adam Sandler does. There you go. Very, very cool. And don't forget, fans, if you do go to the cinemas, stick your phones on uh, flight mode, put them in your pockets or your handbags, whatever you're carrying with you, and just pretend they just are not there, which is the way to go. Any final words before we wrap up for this evening, Mr. Jaffro? I feel like a big bunch of uh, salty popcorn at the moment. That popcorn does taste mighty fine, very groovy. Um, with that in mind, we're actually going to depart for the evening, so be sure to party hard, rock on, and as always, Mr. Jeffro, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy, guys. See ya. <laughs>